Hey, I'm going to do this um, lecture for UPS systems or uninterrupted power supply systems. So basically, even in the name, it's kind of telling you what uh, what its task is, is to basically provide uninterrupted power to certain scenarios. Um, there's a lot of process systems in um, manufacturing and in control that they cannot have a shutdown of, of electrical equipment and in the hospitals where human life is a concern. And um, again, it's mainly around safety. If something shuts down and that's gonna cause a safety issue, we cannot have it shutting down. Okay, so then it goes into the uh, makeup of the UPS systems. So this is a, obviously an extremely large one. If you're only used to seeing a, a simple computer backup one, it's just something you literally plug in the wall. But the one in the college would be significantly in size like this as well too. So we can have our breakers, the transformers uh, section, we'll get through into all these specifically. Our power section, the battery bank, and the control section. So we'll get through all these uh, examples coming up here. So the operation of a UPS is basically has three components. We have the rectifier, the battery, and the inverter section. So the rectifier, again, just like we've talked about, rectifying AC into DC. So I have DC coming out of the rectifier. So AC input from my source um, out to DC, which charges the battery and also supplies DC to the inverter section. Now the inverter section basically just takes the DC and outputs it back to AC. Now you may be thinking, well, what's the whole point of this? Well, the whole point is to have this DC supply to the inverter. So at times that's coming from the rectifier from our AC supply, but it could also come from the battery bank. So if the power goes out, we would lose the AC input. We would still have this battery bank to supply DC to the inverter and still have our AC output to our load. And that's the critical part. Okay. So um, whether we have our AC supply or the battery, the inverter is going to take that DC input and output it to um, AC. And it's going to do that, again, some loads need nice, smooth, um, pure voltage coming out with no spikes, no dips, nothing. So that inverter section can provide that AC. So they can literally have people uh, have some pieces of equipment that that don't like over or under voltages or need like a frequency within a narrowable or acceptable range um, this can be achieved through this inverter output okay so it's it's it think of the ac input it from our supply here can be filled with spikes and irregularities that some equipment doesn't like so we would use the um, inverter section to supply that nice smooth ac output or conditioned is what they're calling it. Sorry. Right. Okay. So now we want to talk about again, if we lose our AC, it instantly changes from charging to a discharging state. So now I'm not charging my DC anymore. Now my DC is the actual supply to the um, inverter section and we're still getting our AC output to our load. Uh, the duration of the on battery mode is from five to 30 minutes and depends on the capacity of the battery installed or the bank. Before the end of the on battery mode operation period, you must arrange for the safe shutdown of critical loads or the startup of another standby power source. So we are not meant to be running on UPS for very long. It's literally a transfer period. So the power went out unexpectedly. We either need to safely shut down loads that don't need to be technically need to be in operation at that time because we don't need an abrupt shutdown because that can cause issues or we need to supply it with a uh, backup generator or something in the event of a hospital we would switch to backup power okay so it's it's like a transition period for us to maintain our loads um, while it's supplying critical loads through the inverter there has to be a method of continuing to supply the loads if the ups goes into failure okay so it has electronic components it could go into failure at any time um, could have issues we need to still be able to supply the critical load at that time so this isn't on a, a loss of supply this is just an issue with the ups so when it cannot be operated due to high temperature overloading or a failed inverter it requires immediate shutdown the ups system shuts down and instantly closes a bypass switch so there is no significant power interruption to the critical loads so if our ups goes down 
So we no longer have this, we have a bypass switch that gets turned on and it's either this transformer, the output transformer is either supplied by P1 through the bypass or the primary part, uh, the second part of the primary through the UPS. It'd be one or the other scenario and then our output is from our secondary which can be maintained either through the bypass or through the UPS. Uh, the figure below shows the UPS system shut down and the bypass switch closed so there's no significant power interruption to the critical load. So again, now we're going through the bypass. We're not going through the UPS any longer. And again, you could also have to shut that UPS down for maintenance um, and that this would allow us to do that as well too. So um, again, the, either the AC input bypass or the output from the inverter supply the, trans, uh, supply the primary of the transformer. Transformer provides filtering, isolation, and voltage matching. The secondary supplies the critical loads. The synchronizing circuit is inside the, the synchronizing circuit inside the UPS controls the inverter output phase relationship with the bypass source. So the AC supply from the source is unconditioned and may not be good at this time. So again, the whole point of potentially going through a UPS2 to provide that unconditioned smooth AC, we're definitely not able to take advantage of that at this point. But this would just be, again, a, um, a, a momentary thing that we want to just either replace the UPS if it's, if it's been destroyed or we need to do maintenance on it. So this would be a short-term uh, solution going through this bypass switch because it is unconditioned now. Uh, UPS redundant systems. So for higher reliability, we could have more than one. Uh, UPS. So if it fails, we're not just going through a bypass, we're potentially going through another UPS, which would still give us that smooth, un, uh, unconditioned, or sorry, conditioned power, sorry, um, out of that UPS unit. Now, what they're saying is to save money and, and maintenance costs, the time that it needs to be provided for on the event of a loss of AC power is still the same. So we wouldn't have to double the battery bank. We could still use one battery bank, but just have two UPS units that's gonna pull from that battery bank, depending on which one's actually on at, at any time. So now in this instance, we have, for our redundant system, we have our bypass feeding, there's a primary there to our transformer, or a primary from UPS one, or a primary connection from UPS two, again, with the same secondary output. So the load, the whole point of this is that this load always sees, um, sees power coming out. Um, because UPS operating time, again, if we don't need to increase the operating time, we don't need to increase the battery bank. So we can use the same battery bank for anyone. So here's our common battery bank even though we may have two UPS uh, scenarios or yeah, inverter sections. So here we're rectifying it. Um, could be a totally separate rectification from a separate UPS too, but they're just showing the two separate inverter sections um, for, for the actual UPSs here. So we have a common bank and then two separate inverter sections that's gonna output to our transform transformer. So we'll talk a little bit about static switches. Um, that's what we're going to use for our inverter section. That's going to be um, how we get our pulse width modulation output. Um, they just talk about how, why we use these and, and the types we use. They kind of just mention it in passing, so treat it as such. So a static switch we've talked about already, our, our diodes, our SCRs, our triacs, all that kind of stuff, we're static switching. So we can't use relays relays in this to to switch there they just aren't really fast enough and they again they have issues with maintenance um, excessive heat that kind of thing so we use static switches or solid state switches because they have no moving parts and can operate in microseconds so extremely fast because of their high speed switching there is no noticeable distortion in the supply voltage when the bypass switch is operated so that switching to go from UPS to bypass happens very quickly. Uh, it has to so that we don't see any distortion going to the primary, which would in in uh, turn affect the secondary of that transformer. So this is literally what they're talking about. We see this distortion at the instance of transfer. The load is not going to see this and have any issue with that at all. Again, extremely small because that switching is so fast. Okay, so the load literally does not notice that switching at all.
Um, each solid state contact of a static switch has two thyristors in an anti-parallel configuration. So we talked about this when we talked about triax too, if these are two SCRs. Uh, it's basically so that we get both sides of the sine wave coming through. So we want to be able to see both um, the positive and negative alternation coming through. Uh, thyristors are usually SCRs. When you apply a proper AC voltage to the gate, one of the twos is conducting during each half cycle or each alternation, and the static switch is in the closed position. Okay, so we're still gating these guys again, and they still have to be forward biased in order to conduct. If the kitchen condition for a load transformer, or sorry, a load transfer to the bypass are present, the UPS operation logic board sends a bypass signal to the bypass gate control board, which sends firing signals to the gates of the SCRs. So again, now we've noticed that there's an issue or, uh, with the UPS. It sends a signal to the bypass gate control, which starts firing these SCRs and provides us an alternative path to the um, primary of the transformer. So we're not going to be going through here anymore. We'll be going through um, this primary connection now. Again, as soon as it gets that signal, it starts gating those SCRs and allows the um, AC to go right straight through through the bypass switch now and to the uh, transformer to help supply our loads. The status switch then conducts and the bypass source supplies the critical loads. Once the UPS failure is corrected, the logic board sends the inverter signal to the bypass gate control board and the UPS output supplies the critical load. So once this is back online and everything looks good, it will shut down the bypass signal and go to the inverter and then supply from the UPS again. Uh, the most common type of inverter used in UPS systems is the pulse width modulation type. So this is the inverter section now that we're talking about where we, this is an objective two now. So we have this scenario where we have AC coming in, we've rectified it to DC to store the battery and to supply the inverter. So what's the inverter going to do now with this DC supply? So here's our DC supply going into this inverter. There are four solid state switches, which are normally SCRs, BJTs, or IGBTs. These four switches are connected in two totem pole configurations shown below. The switches are programmed to turn on and off in pairs, namely Q1 and Q4. So this switch and this switch will show on the next slide how they uh, let... Uh, the path go through for our AC output and then Q2 and Q3 as the second alternation. Only one pair can be on at the same time or there would be a short um, if they were on all at once, short on your DC supply. So with Q1 and Q4 on we have our DC going through again this would be our AC output so now we have a DC bump coming through because Q1 and Q4 are closed and then back to the source. So this is what we'd see on our graph is we'd see when Q1 and Q4 are on, we see the DC voltage coming right to a maximum, staying on until it's literally off, then turns off again. Okay, so when we have this little blurb here if Q1 and Q4 are conducting. Now, alternately, when Q2 and Q3 are on, we can see if we look at this section right here, L1 and L2 of the AC output, the difference in direction, the way the, the positive is going through L1 and L2 between when Q1 and Q4 are firing as opposed to when Q2 and Q3. So it's going the opposite way. So again, we just look at those differences. Current flow is changing as we use Q1 and 4 or 2 and 3. So 2 and 3 is going to give us basically our negative alternation and gives us a kind of a, a DC blip on that side. And again, it's whatever the DC supply is. So if it's 340 volts, that's what this goes to. It's going to be, it's either on or off. So there's no gradual increase. It's just 340 volts, boom, it's on. The whole time those switches are on. Same thing, now negative 340. The full amount of the DC is coming through at any as soon as those switches are on. Okay, so that's the pulse that's coming through. Now, if we can look at different pulses for different amounts of time, we can control the amount of voltage that's coming out of that at any time. If it's on for a longer period, we're going to see 
that 340 volts for longer, which is gonna give us a, a more steady state of voltage. If we have it on for shorter, we're gonna get less voltage. So now it becomes about timing. How, how long are these pulses on is gonna dictate the um, amount of voltage that's gonna come through, okay? So even you can see here where we have really light, thin pulses, that's a lower voltage. So we're kind of mimicking a sine wave here where this portion right here would be our max and then we're slowly decreasing down to zero, then zero again, and getting a max on the negative. Okay, so it's a high-speed computer that can, can control this single phase inverter to produce positive and negative rectangular pulses. Varying the on and off times of these pulses can uh, cause the inverter to output many rectangular pulses with different on and off times. So different values of average voltage is what it is. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, this example they got going on here. So at spot A, this would be our maximum. So we can see that at 90 degrees. B would be a value again, less than maximum, but not quite zero on the positive. And then C, same thing at 300 degrees. We're gonna get an instantaneous value of voltage here. Again, not max, but not zero. So we can pick an instantaneous voltage at any time. In fact, that's what the computer's doing and basically making those instantaneous values parts on our pulse width modulation to basically mimic this sinusoidal wave. So it's not a true sinusoidal wave coming out, but it, it, it mimics it. And the load sees, just basically thinks it's seeing true AC output to the load. So it talks about how we get this timing. So it's saying a period over one cycle. So we're using our period formula. We're taking one divided by our frequency. This is how long it's taking to do a full cycle. So we split it in half, or we use 120 instead of 60, and we will get the actual time for an alternation. So this is how many pulses we need for this alternation. So we have it on the positive and the negative. And then we can look at each individual pulse to see what kind of value of voltage we can get at, at A, B, and C. We'll just talk about these ones specifically. So A was our... Um, maximum and this is a 340 volt input to the um, the DC input into the inverter but we would like to get 120 volt RMS out that's the whole point of this scenario here is to output now a 120 volt um, sine wave out of that so we know that has a maximum of around 169.7 or 170 volts max to get an RMS of 120 so what we're doing is at point A, which would be our maximum, we don't want to see 340 volts because that won't give us 120 volts RMS. We need to see 170 volts max. That will give us an RMS value or an instantaneous value at 45 degrees of 120 volts, which is our RMS. So what we need to do is say, well, if these times based on the cycle and the frequency we had is a 10 microsecond section, well, if I'm gonna see 340 volts DC come through here on this pulse, if I had it on for the full 10 microseconds, I'd have a value of 340 volts, which again is too high for this scenario. We need 170 volts. So what we're gonna do is just have that pulse on for half the time. If we get the pulse on for half the time, we're gonna see an average of half of this voltage. So if we can pulse it on for half and have it off for half, we're going to see 170 volts under that pulse. So that kind of shows us how we're going to get these values of voltage. Now, if we look at, so this is point A again, on for, uh, basically not on at all, then on for half the time. Okay, and that's going to give us our average. If we look at point B now, we need a lower value because we need 85 volts because of the location. If again, if we go back here, it's at 150 degrees. So if we take 170 volts times the sine of 150, it's our 85 volts here. So that's what we need to get. So in order to get 85 volts on, we just have to change the amount that this pulse is on for. We want a reduction, so it's not gonna be on as long. We're gonna be off for longer, okay? So if it's only on for a quarter of the time, we're only gonna get the quarter of this total voltage that's coming in. So again, we can manipulate and basically change our average output by just deciding how long and how, how long on and how long off these pulses are. But again, we're still seeing that 340 volts come through no matter what. That's why it's the timing that changes everything. Okay, so again, this one, we're looking at 
trying to get our uh, point C and we're looking for a, a negative value now because we're in that second alternation, the negative one, and we need to get 147 volts. So we're just gonna find out basically the same ratio between the voltage and time and show that we only need to be on for 4.3 microseconds out of the 10 to get this average voltage out. Okay, and again, it's negative because we're in that, that uh, alternation of our full cycle. Okay, and that was for a value at 300 degrees um, on our sine wave. So what the computer is doing is basically calculating all these instantaneous voltages and then saying how long on and off the pulse needs to be in order to achieve that. And then basically creating a output that mimics a sine wave. Again, not a true sinusoidal wave, but shows the output just like a sine wave where we have peaks and we have different values of voltage going down to zero and then peaking again in the negative and alternating. So the average voltages between every pulse are programmed precisely so that the average voltages are equal to the same instantaneous values of output voltages in the sine wave. In order to smooth out the inverter output, a filter consisting of a coil or capacitor is required. In many UPS installations, the inductance of the transformer windings is usually sufficient to smooth out the ripples. Okay, so we talked about filtering before, how a choke filter or L-section or capacitor, they smooth out that output. So what they're saying is basically that transformer, which is like a giant coil, is like a giant choke uh, filter on there. So we don't potentially don't need to add filtering if we have that transformer output. Installation of UPS, again, into the four areas of installation. We have our inputs, include the supply circuit, incoming circuit breaker, that's our AC input. The DC, which includes the battery bank, disconnect switch, and DC link. The outputs include your critical load wiring, output transformer, and maintenance bypass switch. And then our auxiliaries include cooling fans, air filters, and display panels. Again, on larger UPS installations here. So we'll show some examples of each. So our inputs, an independent circuit must be installed as the AC supply to a UPS system. So independent circuit. The supply conductor ampacity, so the conductors that we're sizing to go to the UPS, must meet the input rating of the UPS plus the battery charging demand. So it's not only just the input rating that we need for the UPS. If there is a battery charging demand, which there will be for a UPS, we have to include that um, before we size any of our input uh, conductors. The phase sequence of a three-phase supply to a UPS bypass must be the same as the inverter output so that the UPS can synchronize the two voltages. Okay, the DC, the battery cells, our UPS are lead acid type and either vented or sealed. Uh, the battery disconnect is used to isolate the battery bank from the UPS for maintenance purposes. Our outputs, Pulse with modulation inverters operate at very high switching frequencies and their solid state switches generate significant amounts of waste heat. As a result, inverter cooling is a prime concern in UPS installations. So again, not that they don't create heat, they create less heat than, than uh, relay coils and such and less maintenance, but they still do create heat. And we've talked significantly about heat sinks and needing to get that heat away or, or it would be at the destruction of our uh, electronic uh, components. Again, unlike transformers and motors, uh, inverters are solid state devices and have no overload capacity. So those switches in there, basically they can't see an, an exceedance of what their rating is for any length of time. So it's a good practice to ensure that the inverter rating is at least 125% of the maximum critical load demand. For the same reason, UPS output may not be able to handle motor starting because we see that high inrush current. You must start large rated motors through a bypass source or by another starting uh, by another motor starting device. Okay, because UPS is not going to be able to handle that 600, 500% starting current and potentially damage it. So again, they have a, a picture here of our battery cells, our battery bank. Again, whatever the capacity needs to be to run that, that load for 5 to 30 minutes. Um, we have our switch to disconnect and either maintain or test these batteries to make sure they're in good working order. Um, the circuit breaker, in order to do that, they just talk about it being a make before break scenario. So the maintenance bypass switch assembly is made up of three circuit breakers labeled MB for maintenance bypass. Okay, so this guy right here. UIP for UPS input. So there's our input to our UPS and our output or UOP. 
A special make before break switching sequence is necessary to maintain continuous power to critical loads during UPS shutdown. Again, these loads cannot see a, a break in power. Okay, so the MB must make before the UIP and UOP break. So a make before break. We want to make this connection before we open this one and then our load's not going to see a difference and then on the same way when we go back these guys here would make a connection before breaking that okay again it's just to make sure that that load does not see any any stoppage in power the biggest thing i think of is i mean a computer great that's fine a critical load where we have they talk about a boiler scenario if we don't if we lose control of a boiler circuit we could have extreme uh, temperature issues or, or gas issues happening. I relate it mainly back to a hospital. If we have somebody that's on life support, we cannot see that thing turn off at all ever. Okay, so that's kind of what I've used in my head to get through this UPS is we cannot see this thing turn off. Okay, uh, most UPS systems have more than one cooling fan for redundancy, meaning it can still operate when one fan fails. Okay, again, to keep that stuff cool, avoid any kind of destruction of our solid state devices uh, we want to have some cooling happening in there and again more is better if we have one go down we can replace it while it's still operational um, again these are for larger ups sub, uh, systems i've never seen one until i got to the college here um, but they would have a display and we'll show some examples of that here's our filters because we have air coming in from our fans so it needs to be filtered and uh, going past all those components in the lower cabinet so most UPS have air filters installed in the lower part of the front panel of the cabinet for cold air intake. The inverter is installed there so the cold air can blow directly on the inverter's heat sinks. You must never alter the cooling air path in the cabinet, okay, because that's doing its job cooling down our solid state devices. So here's an example of a panel display showing the mode of operation. So whether we're in bypass or in UPS mode, it's going to tell us what's, what's happening. Um, saying the system is normal there's no alarms all that kind of stuff here's uh, another pic of the panel display showing the inputs and output voltages again just some examples so you can see if you haven't seen anything like this before um, here's a display of the alarm history so it shows when bypass is available um, clears your low battery bypass because of under voltage so it's it's switching on that constantly right if it sees any issues and then it has a log of it so you as the maintenance or operator you can come and have a look at this and see how it's going um they talk about having an insulated vacuum to do any cleaning or maintenance um anti-static is is a big uh I guess concern because we don't want to have any static or any shorts go across any of that electronic equipment and we do need to clean that area out. Um, again I've had some students say basically their job for a day was to go and and clean out the UPS system and then test the batteries and make sure they were working. Um, so there is maintenance involved with this as well too. Uh, the testing and troubleshooting Time to go through in general here. We got our, here's our circuit boards. We have a rectifier, our DC link, our inverter. These are the th three things we would want to test. If we want to test the rectifier, we have to disconnect it from the DC link. And then we can read and see what our expected DC output is of that rectifier. So we could see that with a voltmeter or a scope, we would see the wave. Um, so we could test that there. Um, we can test the batteries banks with a discharge resistor. Um, Always check your manufacturer's specs with this stuff, but you can isolate the battery bank from the UPS system by opening the disconnect switch. So that, that's probably the easiest thing to do because we just basically open that switch. It'll run straight off the rectifier during that point and we can do any checks or maintenance to the uh, battery bank at that point. In order to test the inverter section, we still have to make sure that we have the rectifier and DC link section working properly. So you test that first, make sure it's all good, then allow it to go into the inverter section to be able to test the bypass, uh, make sure the output is good, um, and you could test everything on, on that. Okay, so again, the, some of that stuff needs to be checked before, but that inverter section, section has to be connected still for testing.
So we have to check all that stuff upstream first and then make sure that it's good and then we can test the inverter section. It's basically the same as the rec fire to troubleshoot it, but the inverter control circuit is more complex. Inverter control circuit consists of logic and driver boards. Again, we check the test points and the supply voltages, and that's the first thing we're going to check. Either the SCRs or IGBTs could go bad, but um, we would check what we can and replace what we have the means to do. Okay. So definitely go through and read through that module, do the test at the end. Um, again, this is an application of electronic device, so it just a little bit more general, taking some of the stuff we've already known about this, um, these electronic components, and then basically um, putting them to use. So have a read through that, um, do the test. The next one will be VFDs, which is very similar to this. Okay.